Eight years ago, I was broke. My marriage was failing. My stepdad was dying. My son was recovering from a mysterious illness and our house still hadn't sold. <sighs> it was a lot, but minimalism saved me from it all. If we haven't officially met yet, my name is Renee. I'm a recovering shopaholic turned minimalist. And my goal with stuff is to help you have less so that you can do more. Since 2017, I have been sharing my minimalist journey on my blog, podcast, and social medias. To my surprise, our message started to spread to places like Becoming Minimalist, New York Post, Newsweek, Parents Magazine, and I even got a print feature in Marie Claire with Priyanka Chopra on the cover. The crazy part is that 10 years ago, I had this idea in my mind that I had some sort of message that I was meant to spread, but I'd been so busy just accumulating stuff in my life that I wasn't really able to do that. But that's okay, because I guess I hadn't done it yet either. Up until that point, I had centered my life around the way I looked, the stuff I could buy, and what other people thought of me. I was desperate to keep up with the trends, and I really wanted to project this image to the rest of the world that said, I am successful, look at me. <laughs> Even though I had gotten really good at projecting this image, the only real self-work I was doing was retail therapy, which wasn't getting me very far. Yes, I had an amazing shoe collection, but I was waking up stressed out every single day. I was constantly working, our finances were struggling, and after we moved into the house of our dreams, my marriage started crumbling. In 2000. 2013, we bought our dream house on a whim. I cannot stress enough how little financial planning went into the purchase of this home, but it had everything we wanted. It had four bedrooms, four bathrooms, a loft, a studio for my photography, and a partridge in a pear tree. Okay, there wasn't a partridge in a pear tree, but there were cranes in the backyard all the time because we had a stream running through the backyard. Even though this was the house and the neighborhood that we had always dreamed of living in, because we used to drive by it every day on the way to our townhouse. And we thought once we live there, we will have made it. Even though that was something we had always believed, my husband and I both had reservations before we moved in and we completely ignored them. People told us we just had cold feet, it would be fine not to worry, but now I wish we would have listened to those little intuitive nudges that were telling us this isn't it. It wasn't long before all of our weekends were spent doing yard work or maintenance on the house. I was working extra nights and weekends just to try to keep up financially. I can't tell you how sad it is to know that your family is going out and doing something and you're spending your entire Saturday shooting a wedding. I loved shooting the weddings, but I still miss my family. I did my best to put on a happy face and make sure any worries that my husband had were completely wiped out by me, which caused me to go into people pleaser overdrive and work extra hours on top of being a stay-at-home mom. <sighs> Despite my best efforts, there was still a strain that was put on our marriage. And there was just this underlying stress simmering beneath the surface, I think for everybody. Not to mention the fact that we had little to no financial knowledge. Like most Americans, beyond basic budgeting and paying our bills, we didn't really know what we were doing when it came to managing our finances, saving for the future, investing, paying off debt, none of it, no clue. Basically, we were living paycheck to paycheck in our dream life, which is more like a nightmare, right? I know what this can sound like. Back in 2018, when I finally got up the courage to share this story with the world, I faced so much backlash from people who told me that I was stupid, ignorant, or not appreciative. And while I know our story can sound like a poor baby soaked in privilege sob story, while you're not wrong, I also think this is something that's way more common than a lot of us realize. This is why I have always loved the Jim Carrey quote goes something like this. <laughs> I wish that everyone could have all of their dreams come true and get everything they ever wanted so that they could realize that it's not the answer. Even when Jim Carrey shared that, he faced so much backlash from people who were saying, easy for you to say. And the reality is, it is easy for him to say. If Jim Carrey, this super famous millionaire, billionaire, can tell us that money and fame and success and stuff is not the answer, then I think we should probably believe him. I didn't, but we should. Because unfortunately, sometimes I think life only works by having us get the things we think we want only to realize they're not the right thing. And who knows, what works for some doesn't work for all. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. However, I found the more that I shared my story, the more I started to receive emails and DMs from people saying, thank you, I have felt this way. Or, oh my gosh, we were just about to upsize our house and we had so many reservations about it. We are pausing on selling our house. Thank you so much for telling us. So even though our story might not resonate with everyone, I think it's resonating with a lot of people out there. And that feels really good to know that I am giving a voice to anyone who might feel the same. Up until this point, my husband had been my best friend. So life felt really isolating and depressing when all of a sudden I was living with this person who used to be my friend, but now we were barely speaking. I didn't know what to do with myself or my time until I had a friend tell me that she had been going to the library a lot. I started checking out books by Joshua Becker. I watched the Minimalists documentary. I read a book called You Can Buy Happiness and It's Cheap and one called The Power of Half and all of their minimalist stories really aligned with mine. It was a lot of people who were realizing that the stuff that they had in their life wasn't filling them up and wasn't giving them any deeper sense of purpose. They wanted something different for their life and they knew they had to let go of their stuff in order to get it. Despite the fact that I loved all of this input from fellow minimalists, the true message that began to change my life was from the late author Wayne Dyer. In his book, Wishes Fulfilled, he put it really simply where he said, ordinary living is so ordinary. Ordinary living is something like filling out the forms, paying your bills, getting the job, retiring, playing with your grandkids, and dying. And there's nothing wrong with ordinary living. But if that were totally acceptable to you, you would not be reading this book. And for the first time in my life, I felt like someone had uncovered my deepest, darkest secret. I had this feeling in my stomach that said, this isn't it. There's more than this. I've been filling up my life with all the wrong things. And through reading more spiritual material like Wayne Dyer's, I started to get that feeling that maybe following my intuition would be okay and maybe it would lead me to the places I've always been meant to go. But then this begs the question, if we wanna change our life, why do so many people start by decluttering their stuff? Here are three things that I think make us do this. Number one, somewhere along the way, the lines get crossed and we start to think a happy life equals having lots of stuff. I know I personally grew up after having both of my parents divorce each other and then get divorced again. I wanted nothing more than a solid home. So whenever I watched movies back in the 90s, like Home Alone, Father of the Bride, Cheaper by the Dozen, the one thing that brought everyone together was this home. Steve Martin even has a monologue in Father of the Bride, specifically talking about how much he loves his house. So somewhere in my brain, I decided, oh, a nice house equals a good home. But that's not right. That is so not right. Number two, if you have no idea what you want, it's a lot easier to figure it out when you get rid of some stuff so that you've got the time, space, and energy to figure it out. But lastly, and I don't think anyone else is really talking about this, that decluttering a mindset or a limiting belief is a whole lot harder than donating a pair of shoes. But a crazy thing I found was that the more I got comfortable letting go of my stuff, the more I started to feel confident that I could let go of the other things, like people please, saying yes to everybody, always making sure everyone else around me was taken care of before taking care of myself. Basically, minimalism became a stepping stone to my own self-development, no longer shopping therapy, and started decluttering my closet instead. <laughs> After going through the process of decluttering my life, in 2015, I got this little intuitive nudge and immediately ran upstairs to go tell my husband. I had to carefully approach this because of the two of us, he is definitely the one who thinks through a decision until the day he dies. (laughs) But I ran upstairs and I told him, let's sell the house. We've been feeling this distance in our marriage. We've been feeling this distance between our kids. We've been stressed out financially. We're working every weekend. What if we just sold the house? Now, this is where something comes into play called the sunken cost fallacy. It's this thing where we keep investing in something because we've already invested in it. Yes, we had already put money into this house. Yes, we had only lived there for a year and a half. Yes, we had just refinanced it. There were so many excuses as to why we should continue to invest in this house and stay there. But I knew in inside, the best chance we had at creating that happy home that I wanted so bad was if we just started over. So we put the house on the market and seven months later, it sold. (laughs) 
And in those seven months of listing our house, my stepdad was diagnosed with a terminal illness. Our son fell sick in the hospital and our credit cards became more maxed than ever. It was awful. But by the end of it, I was more determined with a clearer vision of what I wanted for my life. And a big house wasn't it. It's been eight years this month since we got an offer on the house and knew we were finally taking the steps toward living a life aligned with the one that we wanted to live. So this YouTube channel is going to be dedicated to me telling you how. The tools and strategies I've applied to my life, simple declutter methods that have made things so much easier, especially with kids, how we taught our kids minimalism and money, and what we did to create a multi-million dollar investment plan even though eight years ago we were flat broke. Not to mention how minimalism inspired me to start practicing slow living even as a busy mom in the suburbs. If you want some sneak peeks into what we've been up to for the last eight years, you can start with the podcast, blog, my social medias, or you can just tell me what else you want to know. Drop a comment and let me know. Oh, and be sure to like and follow along for the whole journey.